This is not an attack on Darwin as a man or a thinker or a scientist, but it's the job of science to figure out what guesses are right and what are wrong. Scientists are paid for making guesses, not for making right guesses, but for making interesting, plausible ones. If scientists, after the guess has been made, don't do their job, don't investigate the guess, don't do their best to figure out is it true or false, then we are false to science and we're betraying science. Here's a question. Are you allowed to seriously question Darwin's theory of evolution like all, ever? Even when you see the math does doesn't seem to add up. Well, three very bright men with opposing views chew on that question and it's worth checking out. Welcome to One Life Network, everyone. I'm Brett. I've been a pastor for a very long time. And at One Life, we're passionate about exploring cultural conversations from a Christ-centered worldview with people who believe and those who don't believe. So if that sounds like you, please subscribe. Uh, we'd love to have you along for the journey. Now, the three men that are being interviewed are David Galanter. Uh, he's a professor of computer science at Yale University. Uh, he made major contributions in the area of computing in his career. He's also known for being the target of the Unabomber. For those of you who remember that, he nearly lost his life in an explosion. That explains the glove that he has on his hand that you're gonna see. Uh, next is David Berlinski. He's a Princeton PhD who has taught mathematics uh, at schools such as Stanford, Rutgers, uh, University of Paris. And finally, Stephen Meyer, whose area of expertise is the philosophy of science uh, that he has a PhD in from Cambridge University. And he's also the lead voice of the intelligent design movement. So let's check out what they have to say. Okay, so functioning proteins are extremely rare. It's very hard to imagine random mutations leading to functional proteins, except that, and here I quote Dr. Galarenter again, but the theory understands that mutations are rare and successful ones even scarcer. Darwinism knows this. To balance that out, there are many organisms and a staggering immensity of time. Your chances of winning might be infinitesimal, but if you play the game often enough, you win in the end. Correct? That's the and theory. And that's the question. Do you play it often enough? There's always an often enough, and the question is, does the history of life with which Darwin was concerned uh, allow you enough chances to make it uh, at all probable? let's say, or even possible that you'll hit on one, statistically, that you'll hit on one of those amazingly rare necklaces that folds up into a protein that can be stuck in a cell and actually doing, doing anything. I'm not a biologist, and so I look at this and say, yeah, there ain't, sure there's enough time. You know, there, there's been a lot of creatures on Earth, and life has gone on for a long time, but when biologists look at this and try and nail it down and figure it out, try and make a guess, try and use heuristics to make a guess, like using the, the number of total bacteria lifetime as a measure of the number of total mutations we're playing with. The point is, from whatever angle you come at it, the, the answer is no, there has not been enough time. The, the, the number of throws we've had is p too puny even to talk about. It doesn't even approach puniness and David. certainly is nowhere near reasonable. So, so we would get that if we had a reasonable time, but we don't, we did. Well, and, and this is important, uh, important to point out that uh, he said he's not a biologist because I know people would probably point that out, but it, it goes over into the area of mathematics and that's why these guys are talking about this. On one hand, they know the biology uh, argument, but on the other hand, they're, t they're dealing with statistics and um, odds basically. We didn't, we haven't. So let me just be, very explicit from my little Winnie the Pooh bear-sized mind. You are saying, <laughs> you are saying that Darwin is unlikely to have to be able. It's unlikely that species arose the way Darwin said, or you are saying it is impossible. Darwin was just mystic, lovely man, beautiful idea. There's hardly a difference. <laughs> There's hardly a difference. Unlikely, impossible. We're talking about odds that are so prohibitive. If you wish to say it's impossible, fine. I'll defend you saying it's impossible. If you wish to say it's highly unlikely, I'll be in your corner as defense attorney as well. But there's no practical difference. It's look, we've known it about just these didn't things for way. hundreds of years. Right? You get a million monkeys at a million typewriters, all of them typing at random. We know they're not going to produce the collected works of Shakespeare in anything like a reasonable amount of time. It's like that wonderful episode of The Simpsons. Do you remember it? Mr. Burns has a million monkeys typing in a million typewriters. <laughs> They're going to produce the greatest novel ever written. He pulls out one sheet of paper and says, it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> 
stupid monkey. <laughs> That was great. Aren't you glad that was in there as you're talking about all this kind of stuff? Let's, it, 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 that makes the point where we really needed to make the point. Or to, to put the discussion down even lower, the Jim Carrey film, where he's uh, uh, trying to get a date with a, a young lady he fancies, and she tells him to go away. He says, well, what are the, what are the odds a, a, a girl like me and a guy like you could get together? Yeah, not good. And he says, what do you mean, not good? Well, like one in a hundred? And she says, like one in a million. And then he says, but if there's a chance. <laughs> you know, you know. So you're telling me there's a chance. <sighs> yeah! <laughs> I read you. Here's a precise way of, uh, of, yes. of, of uh, cashing out this probabilistic argument. If you have one over 10 to the 77th power is your ratio, but then you have all, if every organism in the history of the planet, and we can estimate that, about 10 to the 40th organisms. So you define Bacteria, little bacteria, tiny things, and, everything. And every and mosquito, every, time one of those, every bacterium. Yeah, every time one of those uh, replicates, there's a possibility for a mutation that could search right. the space of possibilities. So you've got 10 to the 40th possible mutations against a, a search space 10 to the 77th strong. Right. So if you do your exponential math, you end up with you can, what it means is you can search one ten trillion trillionth, one ten trillion trillion trillionth of the possible combinations. So in that case, are you more likely to succeed or fail? You're overwhelmingly more likely to fail to find one of the functional combinations, uh, even taking into account every organism that's lived on Earth. And that's, that, that means that the, the Darwinian hypothesis is overwhelmingly more likely to be false than true. It just didn't happen. Okay, the, one last uh, piece of the argument here that you mentioned. There are other pieces in this book, of course, and in David's book. Um, but here's one last that, that you mentioned in your essay is compelling to you, David Galerner. To help create a brand new, and this is the, the, the question of mut mutations proving harmful at least as often as useful if I have it right, to help create a brand new form of organism, a mutation must affect a gene that does its job early and in the development of the life form and the, controls the expression of other genes that come into play as the organism grows. Evidently, there are a total of no examples in the literature of mutations that affect early development and the body plan as a whole and are not fatal. Somebody explain that one to me briefly. Uh, who wants to, you, you start and Stephen will. If, um, I'm, if, uh, if I want to direct the assembly of an animal that I've got to get in there early before they've finished putting it together, putting all the, you know, the hoofs on and getting the wool on, I've, if he's a sheep, I like sheep, I have to say, you know, I have to get in there early before they start building them. So they don't accidentally build a mouse or a, or a leopard or a, or a zebra. I have to say, look, there's going to be sh a sheep get bones this high, and we need a nose about this big, and we need sheep ears, and we need hooves. If sheep have hooves, I think they do. We need wool. You know, get all, get all this stuff together. So I've got to act early. Now, if I'm going to now if I'm going to create a new species, I'm going to mutate, and instead of building a sheep. I'm going to build a little uh, horse, because horses come in cheap size. What are they called? Well, anyway, they're called. Shetland ponies? Or so, right, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. To do that, I, there may be a mutation that, that makes me order purple wool, or, or the wrong color hooves, or a stomach that won't quite fit. But a mutation that is going to recreate the creature in such a way that it's a different creature is, biologists tell me and farmers tell me, almost certainly likely to be fatal. I mean, a, a, a mutation that makes a huge difference and that starts putting the head on backwards, it starts, starts giving him 17 tails or, or too many internal organs or forgets the blood or something like that, because this is right early on that I'm acting when I'm doing tremendously important things. And if I make a slip at this all-important stage, I'm not going to make a little error in the density of the fur. It's going to be a big error in the design of the internal and the external that makes this creature what it is. So that's, a, that's an informal intuitive explanation. But there's Steve a good, can give you a, a, or, a, or Dave can give you a good argumentative disjunction. If you talk about major changes, if they come late in development, they're not going to make a difference. The, the organism is already constructed. may have Maybe more lavish eyebrows. Right, okay. If they come early, 
they can't make a difference because inevitably they destroy the organism. Too many things downstream depend on those early exactly. cell divisions. Yeah. So we're, we're faced with a real destructive dilemma. Late, no good. Early, no good. Well, when? We've yeah. sort of exhausted the, uh, the possibilities. And I'm sure that David Gallerner wants to stick up for Darwin one more time and say he couldn't have known this. <laughs> <laughs> it, this is not an attack on Darwin as a man or a thinker or a scientist, but it's the job of science to figure out what guesses are right and what are wrong. Scientists are paid for making guesses, not for making right guesses, but for making interesting, plausible ones. And if scientists, after, after the guess has been made, don't do their job, don't investigate the guess, don't do their best to figure out is it true or false, then we are false to science and we're betraying science. All right. Intelligent design from David Galerner's essay. The evidence suggests to Meyer, who's seated with us today, that an intelligent designer must have been responsible. I can't accept intelligent design as Meyer presents it. Now, that's a very, very important point, that the, the people sitting here are not just trying to sell intelligent design. Uh, the, the, Berlinski and Gleitner actually don't agree with it. Uh, Meyer does, but they're at least having the discussion. They've defined the problem, and now they're going about trying to find the solutions and giving their opinions on that, which is really good stuff. Watch this. Close quote. You also have seated next to you David Berlinski, who has been, who is, this is David, who has said that his attitude toward intelligent design, and I'm quoting him, is warm but distant. It's the same attitude that I display toward my ex-wives. <laughs> so, so you have one man who can't accept it, another man who definitely wants to keep his distance. That leaves Meyer out. So, so well, I don't know, you want to start the easier case? Try to convince David? Tell us, what, tell us what intelligent design is that distinguishes it from some kind of effort to sneak God in by some back door. Sure. This is critical because I, in, in the debates over this uh, throughout my adult life, I've heard people usually not define intelligent design well before they argued against it, and I think his definition is very good. Uh, the intelligent design... But, but parenthetically, yeah. just yeah. one word. Yeah. That's definitely not Steve's intention. In, in this book, in Intelligent Design, it's not a way to bring in a theological argument. It is a scientific approach, purely and absolutely valid scientifically, and one can agree with it or disagree with it, but one doesn't have to reject it insofar as theology making an illegal move, because that's not what he's doing. That's Which not is what, what he's accused so of all the time, but the he's argument not. Sure. Briefly, so. And then we can just discuss it. Um, the, the, the big discovery of the 1950s and 60s was that the DNA molecule encodes information right. in a roughly digital or alphabetic or typographic form. This why, do you, was, why do you use the term digital? Well, because in computer science, we have characters. You know, zeros and ones. I see. I see. This, this, was, this is Crick, 1957. It's the sequence hypothesis. He realized that, that the information in DNA, or the, the, the chemical subunits of DNA called nucleotide bases, were functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or like the zeros and ones in a section of computer code. It, that is to say, it's not, it wasn't their chemical properties that gave them their function, but rather their specific arrangement in accord with an independent symbol convention, which was later explicated in the form of what we call the genetic code. So we had genetic text functioning according to a code. So it really was a pure, it was, it was pure information. It, it, this is a genuine information storage system. Crick, by the way, was a code breaker in World War II. So this, this is a fascinating, is an application of the information science system molecular biology. Now what we, this is, and this is the argument that I make, is that what we know from experience is that information, whether we find it in a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or uh, information embedded in a radio signal or in a section of computer code, whenever we find information and we trace it back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not a material process. And what I do in the book in Darwin's Doubt and my prior book, Signature in the Cell, is show that these uh, undirected evolutionary mechanisms that have been proposed as an explanation for the origin of information fail for various reasons. We've talked about the reason the Darwinian mechanism fails, because it can't search the space when it's so vast. The, the odds are overwhelmingly against it. So if we, if we, from a materialistic evolutionary standpoint, don't have any explanation for the origin of the information that's necessary to build new biological form. And yet we do know from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, of a source of information, of a cause of the origin of information. That, that cause is intelligence or mind. 
And so what I've argued in both Darwin's doubt and signature in the cell is that what we're seeing in life is evidence of the activity of a directing mind in the history of life. And, and that's, that's a great summary of the whole idea. And, and usually what people will say is when you hear about intelligent design or something like that, they'll just say, oh, that's just trying to sneak in creationism. It's really not. It starts with this problem of information. That has to be understood. What's the source of the information? And you can debate from there, and they go on and they talk about that, and I would highly recommend that you look at that. But that, that is the real question. How do you get information from random processes? And because we know that all life is based upon information. Uh, I look at it this way as a Christian pastor and as someone who looks at the Bible and does believe what it's telling us, is in the end, the real question is, did mind come from matter, or did matter come from mind? Those, those are the choices that you have. And in our collective experience, like you pointed out, we only know that intelligence can come from mind. It just, and, and information comes from mind, and that's the, that's the critical thing. Well, if you're open to grappling with the possibilities and probabilities concerning Darwinism and design, and, and open to having the conversation, uh, here's a video where we talk about uh, what Charles Darwin himself said about that conversation. I hope all of that uh, helped out. See you next time.